to the Half and Half podcast, where two mixed girls talk about their struggles straddling both worlds that they are a part of in hopes of connecting the others to others who face the same issues in attempts to jumpstart a communal healing process. I'm Haley. And I'm Sabrina. Today we will be talking about our struggles in America and how we have come to this point because of our country's past and present legislation alongside institutionalized racism that continues to persist. But first, today's sponsor. That's right. Today we are sponsored by Introduction to Ethnic Studies, also known as Ethnic Studies 100. Why does Ethnic Studies matter? Well, Ethnic Studies classes allow all students to dive into narratives often left untold by our history textbooks. These histories can result in community healing and discovering of one's identity. You can sign up for Ethnic Studies today by using code half and half for a 10% grade boost. Once again, that's code half and half for a 10% grade boost. Sign up for Introduction to Ethnic Studies and thank you for sponsoring this episode. Now, let's dive into the content. So I guess first, the most important thing to dive into um, on today's topic would definitely be our family identity. So I guess tell me a little bit about where your family's from. Sure. So I'm half white, half Asian, or I identify as half white, half Asian. Yeah. Um, my dad, he is European. I am the European that has percentages. Yeah. So I am one-eighth Welsh, one-eighth French, mm-hmm. one-eighth Irish, and one-eighth, oh, what am I? I'm some other one-eighth. <laughs> but essentially, oh, Irish. Irish. Right, right, right. So I am come from a lot of different European descent. Mm-hmm. And then my mom, she, her family lives in Hong Kong, but they're originally okay. from some village in China. Um, and that's literally just our family history is a village in China, so... You know, hence the half white, half Chinese. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. Super fun. Yeah. What about you? Um, okay, so I identify as half African American and half Mexican. Um, my father's family is from Chicago. Um, Love. Of course, we um, African Americans, so our, our origins are in Africa. But um, we, we our family was in Arkansas for a while, Mississippi, just different areas in the South, and then we eventually ended up in Chicago, and that's where my dad's from. Yeah. And my mom was born and raised in Mexico and ended up moving to the U.S. around the age of 20, I believe. Okay. So they met in Vegas, and Uh that's me. Love. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I guess, like, since we're both mixed, we both come from, like, mixed households. Yeah. Like, what's kind of a struggle that you think you face? Um... I think the main struggle for me is finding a community within both of my distinct communities. Yeah. I think it's definitely difficult to identify with people who don't share the same, I guess, background as I do because I come from two completely different but very rich cultures. Right. That's difficult to explain to someone that, um, my experiences are difficult to explain to someone that hasn't, I guess, gone through the same thing as me. So I think that's most difficult thing for me. What about you? Yeah, I agree. I think also just, like, not feeling completely accepted by each community, right? right? Like, I feel like there's always, like, you're not Asian enough to be Asian, or you're not white enough to be white. No, same thing for me. Right? Or, like, Mm -hmm. you look a certain way. Like, there's Mm -hmm. a certain stereotype. I know we talked about this in our ethnic Mm -hmm. studies class, but there's definitely certain stereotypes that you're supposed to look like if you're, Mm -hmm. say, Chinese and white. And I definitely do not fit those stereotypes, like, physically. Yeah. And so I think, like... Like, having to explain to people what I am, mm-hmm. is, it gets tiring, you know? Yeah. And then having to constantly be up against those stereotypes exactly. and not fully feeling like I fit in, mm-hmm. it's just, you know, I think we both get it. Yeah, I think it's it's almost degrading in a sense to yeah. be told that you're not enough of something when you know that you identify with both so heavily and there's both such big parts of your lives and they've yeah. formed you and shaped you to the person that you are today. It's, it's very difficult to deal with people telling you that, you, you don't fit in with us. You're not enough of us. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a struggle that I think we both understand very yeah. well. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> I like, I think it's really important to like understand the context of like why we feel this way. Yeah. Because I think both of, I mean, we both come from very different backgrounds. 100%. Um, and I think the histories of those backgrounds are what makes us unique and, mm-hmm. but then also explains like the struggles we face. Mm-hmm. Um, so like, you know, just to start off, like, you know, we learned about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Yeah of um, 1882 in, in class, and it was basically the act that banned Chinese immigrants or an- Chinese laborers from immigrating to the United States. Right. Um, and that's just a stigma that's stayed in the United States. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, we talked about how that this was, this was the first racialized act that banned a certain group from yes. coming into the United States. Mm-hmm. And it set a really unfortunate precedent 
into um, you know into the present yeah. with being able to pick out a ethnic group or a racial mm-hmm. group and be like you're not worthy enough to be in America. 100%. And I think mm-hmm. that's a struggle that a lot of Asian Americans face because even if you're born in this country, you're not seen as fully American. Right. I'm sure you can relate with, you know, experiences with your family. Yes, 100%. I think that um, that's something that definitely comes through in my, my Mexican half, I guess. Um, my mother being an immigrant and I guess the whole situation um, of the Mexican-American war, like we learned about in class, there's many... Mexican Americans who the border moved over right so yeah. they were they were forced to be a part of this country But it's a completely different situation when you're immigrating in yes. and and aren't sep- accepted and that's it's a completely different president and two different realities for two different groups of people. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, th- I think this definitely obviously stems back to mm-hmm. settler colonialism yeah. it was kind of the very first topic we talked about in class in how even though this land isn't white people's land mm-hmm somehow that's become the stereotype of Americans. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And if you are not, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, mm-hmm. white, tall, have you know, that character, you don't have those characteristics, yeah. for some reason you're not seen as fully American. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've seen the, that perpetuated with the rights being taken away of people who do not look like that standard, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know you've, we've touched upon, like, you know, slavery, obviously, mm-hmm. yeah. um, but also, like, the Jim Crow era. I know we didn't really talk about this in class, but mm-hmm. if you could elaborate maybe a little yeah. bit on... Yeah, so, of course, um, of course, we went over slavery, like you mentioned in class, and um, we went over the 1619 Project, which is um, an effort put together by the New York Times, and it basically describes 1619 is the, the first year that African slaves touched the continent of the U.S. They were um, imported into Virginia. And that's the first account of slavery that we have in this country. Um, now, of course, we covered that in class, but there are many different periods um, that that Black people and African Americans have had to endure to get to the point that we are at today. Um, and one of them, the very important eras, is the Jim Crow era. Yes. Um, many, many, many uh, negative stereotypes of Black people. There's the um, uh, the stereotype of a Sambo, the stereotype of a Mammy, very degrading terms put upon black people during this era, and this is discussed in the documentary Ethnic Notions. And we recently had a guest speaker who brought this yeah. documentary up, and he, he described how he thinks that this is a very docu- a very important documentary for, for people to watch because it just, it really shows how important the Jim Crow era was to the formation of our nation. Yeah. And um, I, I think that that's just another another important part that his, of our history that has ultimately led us to the point that we are at today. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I feel like, just like speculating, like Jim Crow era, mm-hmm. like really set the precedent for racial discrimination in America. Yes. Obviously, you know, preceding that, we have the... Um, marginalization of the Native Americans who mm-hmm. once inhabited this land. Yeah. Um, but I think it's like a whole different level with slavery and with African Americans in the country mm-hmm. because they were brought unwilling, unwillingly to mm-hmm. this land. Yeah. And I think this is an important distinction to make. I know we brought it up in class, mm-hmm. but the distinction between like the Asian American experience mm-hmm. versus the African American experience. Yes, 100%. The, the choice of immigrating versus Ex- yes. being forcefully taken against your will to this country. Yeah. I think another important aspect of that, of the immigration aspect, like deciding to come to this country um, that we covered was um, immigration from Central America mm-hmm. and through Mexico into the U.S. And there's a history, um, another important part of the U.S.'s history of constantly intervening yeah. in countries in Africa or, or South America, for example, yeah. in Chile. I know that the U.S. Um, intervened, which ultimately led to a coup there, yeah, and led to the complete destruction of the economy and the political state, um, and led them into a 17-year dictatorship. And if it weren't for U.S. intervention, then that would have never occurred, and mass immigration from that country possibly would have never taken place. So I think that that's an, another important part of the U.S.'s history to acknowledge, just how we use our power Mm-hmm. The, the, our country used used our power, and, and still even sometimes today uses our power to to inject our opinions into other countries that yeah. maybe don't have as much power as us. 
and that that has a lot of uh, it causes a lot of issues and has a lot of effects I guess and yeah. one of them is mass migration yeah mm-hmm. just adding on to that like like you said U.S. Inter- intervention with right. just country affairs has led to mass migration for another example is um, the opium wars. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't even think we've touched upon this in class, but a lot of the reason why Chinese American or Chinese workers immigrated to America was the opium wars. And who supplied that opium? It was either America or the European powers. Mm-hmm. Um, and they use it as some sort of way to gain control over a rapidly growing power. You know, China is very old and it has, it's always historically been one of the global powers of the world. And so one way that the U.S. decided to, you know, intervene, they didn't need to, but they did, was the supplying of opium. Right. Um, and so I think that's just another history that people often fail to recognize yeah. when talking about, like, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing with Japanese internment. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, I think that gave America a scapegoat to then discriminate against an entire group of people. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like we talked about, in class with the reading um, things that should be remembered or not forgotten, something, it's one of along those readings, those lines, along yeah. those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about how Japanese internment, the reason why the Japanese were interned was because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Yes. And as a way to basically corral war criminals, if you're seen as Japanese, you are automatically a war criminal. Mm-hmm. And I think this is just another way that the U.S., comes up with a basis for discriminating mm-hmm. against people. Absolutely. When all, I think, all this is just centered around the white person having power mm-hmm. in America. Mm-hmm. I think the common trend line we see is how the, the what you say, like, not the marginalized, but, like, the people in the center, I guess, mm-hmm. um, often hold power by then marginalizing the other groups. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess just another point, just yeah. just a common theme, I yeah. guess. Of I, I think within that discrimination. Yeah, within that, there's definitely a a common theme of needing to justify discrimination. Yes, yeah. there's always a need to justify it. Like another important part of our history is uh, the U.S.'s history is the war on drugs. Yeah, and oh, just yes. a constant need to to justify or find an excuse to to marginalize and and consistently oppress um i guess minority groups in this country so i I think that's definitely a really important point that you bring up yeah i think just something kind of just going back to the colonization and westward expansion and you know just connecting it back to identity Mm -hmm. um i mentioned that my a lot of my dad's side is from european powers and when we did that first report in this class i Mm -hmm. found out a lot of my ancestors immigrated to america when the colonization of america was happening so They are part of the original 13 colonies. They settled in the original 13 colonies. Oh, okay. And I think part of, I guess, healing or, like, accepting that past mm-hmm. is, like, fully educating yourself of the consequences of... While I don't, I feel like I don't have to take ownership for my ancestors' actions, mm-hmm. I feel like understanding the consequences that they've caused mm-hmm. leads to healing in myself and healing... Mm-hmm in, I guess, other mixed people like me, yeah. who then can go forward and educate, I guess, use our privilege to educate those who do not know. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we talked about how ethnic studies is an important class because there are narratives that are often left out of history books. Yes, 100%. And I think by using white privilege, we'll just use the word white privilege, mm-hmm. to be able to uplift those voices is something that's really important because I know we've, you've talked about it in class, um, the idea of performative ac- activism, yes. mm-hmm. um, which was very prevalent in 2020, but I've, I feel like it's been a trend through history where people with privilege try and do things or say that they're going to do things like change the system when ultimately that system benefits them. Yes. And, I, so, I, and so I think by using your white right privilege to not just say that this is going to work, but to make suggestions to change the system or maybe create an entirely new system mm-hmm. is part of being like a historian Corandera, like we yeah. said at the beginning of class. Mm-hmm. In order to heal, we have to first acknowledge our mistakes, acknowledge the consequences that they have, and figure out a new way to move forward. Correct. No, I, I 100% agree. And I think that even though I don't have any any ties to Europe or... No, I wouldn't say any ties. Although I don't have, um, I guess, immediate ties to... to um, colonialism in, in that manner, although I, my family wasn't the one oppressing, we were the ones being oppressed, I still think that I'm definitely in a point of, of privilege 
um, and in many forms, but also with just the knowledge that I've had and have um, the knowledge that I've added upon with like from this class. Yeah, I think that sure. there's definitely a lot of knowledge that can be used to be put towards, um, I guess, making a change and just like you said, healing communities that don't necessarily possess this knowledge or the privilege that I have and, and really just setting forth a precedent that their stories and um, oppressed communities, their stories need to be, their stories need to be shared and, and told. And that's, yeah. that's a big part of being a historian in Curandera, like we learned in class. And I think that's a really important concept that we, that we covered. And I think that's definitely a lesson that we're going to take with us. Yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. For sure. <laughs> um, and then we also, you touched upon the documentary 13th. I think yeah. just as a general note, 13th mm-hmm. is a documentary that I feel like everyone should watch because mm-hmm. it really is eye opening to just the monetization of oppressive systems like the prison system um i feel like as a business major Mm -hmm. it really speaks volumes when Mm -hmm. businesses and corporations start to get involved in politics 100 percent. like i think it's just it speaks to i guess the capitalist nature of our country but also i feel like the deep white supremacy absolutely because historically the heads of these companies are not Mm -hmm. people of color historically Mm -hmm. they're all white people um, and so I think it's just a really eye-opening documentary. I feel like everyone should watch. Yeah. Not sponsored. <laughs> um, but something I wanted to bring up was just they some, I want to say some representative of Alec was trying to defend how Alec does not get involved with social issues, yeah. but rather economic ones. And I have a, a little bit of a problem with this because I think economic issues and social issues are very deeply intertwined. 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about in class how people of color often have their land or assets stolen from them. We mm-hmm. saw it with Native Americans getting their land taken over by white people. We saw it with Mexicans or Mex- now Mexican-Americans mm-hmm. getting their land taken over in the Mexican-American War. We saw it with Japanese internment when Japanese store owners, when they were interned, their stores were taken away mm-hmm. and possessed by white people. And so I think it's very, I don't want to say ignorant, but I, I, I kind of want to say ignorant to say that economic issues and social issues are not are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of historical policies have, that are labeled as economic, Mm -hmm. have social and racial roots. Mm -hmm. I know we talked about redlining in class. I think you're a little bit more educated than I am on the topic. So if you want to kind of explain what redlining is. Well, first of all, I, I, I want to say that I 100% agree with that statement. I feel like we're at a point in this country where the systems of, of racism and oppression they've, they've gone so far and they're at the very like root in our base uh, the base of this country to the point where it's, it's an ignorant statement to make to say that um they're completely separate and they don't intertwine whatsoever but as far as explaining redlining um basically a redlining is a system that was put into place to um once again discriminate against um communities of color um, primarily in this situation, it was against Latino and Black communities, and basically it just quite literally drew lines on a map of a city, and it basically separated areas that were thought of as good enough for um, predominantly white co- communities to live in, or uh, populations to live in, and then other sections um, were lined off that were thought as... Um, I guess, well-suited for co- minority communities to live mm-hmm. in. And, of course, these communities didn't have um, resources allocated in them. There were not um, any good schools, any any um, good health care facilities. And, and that, once again, goes back to the point of everything's 100% intertwined. Yeah. There, although um, this was discrimination in the housing sector, it intertwined with a lot of other things, education, healthcare, right. uh, so many other aspects. So it goes back to your point once again. And uh, I mean, going back to the 13th documentary, which you previously mentioned, I think one of the um, statistics mentioned in this documentary really stood out to me. And it was towards the beginning of the documentary and it said, um, the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world and 5% of the world's population, um, it has 5% of the world's population, excuse me, and 25% of the world's prison. Wow. That's... And <laughs> it's high ridiculous. Statistic. It's, it's, it's... When I saw it, my... I 
I can't say I was necessarily surprised because yeah. of, I mean, the way I've seen everything play out in this country, and of course, mass incarceration is is a is a tool used to oppress communities of color today. Um, but it was just really eye opening to see the numbers placed right there in front of my eyes. Yeah. So um, for sure, I I think that that's just it really shows the progression of from slavery, the antebellum. I mean, for for. African American communities, right? Um, slavery, antebellum period, or Civil War, excuse me, antebellum period, and then skipping forward to Jim Crow, skipping forward Civil Rights Movement, and then now we're at this place of um, from the war on drugs, how that led into mass incarceration. Yeah, and it's just interesting to see how racism has evolved in this country and how, in my opinion, I don't think slavery has ever really gone away. I just think yeah. it's evolved. And mm-hmm. that's, that's kind of like the statement of um, the title of the book, The New Jim Crow, by, I believe, Michelle Alexander. Mm-hmm. It's, this is just a new, a new way to, to enslave black people in, in yeah. communities of color. Yeah, it's like, it's like this, it's, I think the 13th documentary made it very clear that this system, or this country, is founded upon ideas of racism and ideas of white supremacy. 100%. Um, and I think it's, you know, evident when we look at the mass incarceration of black and Latina mm-hmm. men, mm-hmm. especially was what the um, documentary highlighted. Yeah. Um, and just, just like the systemic, I, I feel like we have to understand these issues before we ever move into movements like Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I know 2020 has been obviously a rough year for yes. the black community. It was also a rough year for the Asian yes. community with mm-hmm. um, just, you know, the hatred, la- the uh, hateful language mm-hmm. the Trump administration decided to mm-hmm. use when describing COVID-19. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think without understanding what we've previously talked about, whether it's slavery, whether it's Japanese internment, whether it's Chinese exclusion, mm-hmm. I think all these historical ideas are very are very important to understand before we even talk about why Black Lives Matter is important or why mm-hmm. Stop Asian Hate is important yeah. or why or why we still feel like we are discriminated today, Mm -hmm. and why we think this podcast is important to reach out to those who might also feel discriminated against, but don't feel like they ever have the power to say something about it. Exactly, 100%. Um, So I guess we can kind of move into, like, present issues and present experiences. So I'm just an overarching question. (laughs) What was 2020 like for you? Um... Well, I think in order for me to describe what 2020 was like for me, it's necessary for me to go back to 2016. Um, I think when Donald Trump was elected president, um, of course I knew my identity as an African American and Mexican woman. However, I was still pretty young at that point. I believe we were in seventh grade, about yes. 12 years old when oh, he was goodness. elected. Oh goodness, we were. So, I mean, it wasn't, I had never faced any real discrimination for my yeah. race yes. or any anything that was too that, that stood out to me um but after that election 100% I would say that there was a a shift mm-hmm. I noticed uh one time I went out to a I believe it was a sushi restaurant with my mom and it was just the two of us because we were having a mother-daughter day wow <laughs> and um I remember I was speaking Spanish with her because although my mother is fluent in English, um, that's how she taught me Spanish. She only spoke to me in Spanish growing up, and mm-hmm. I still only speak to Span. I only speak to her in Spanish. Yeah. So we were speaking to each other in Spanish, and um, there was, I guess, a family next to us, and they they had a problem with the fact that we were speaking in Spanish, and made it very, very, very clear to <laughs> us that they had a, an issue with it, and um, it made us very uncomfortable, obviously, and. And we knew that it had to do with like the the tick, the upward tick in um in discrimination following the twenty sixteen election. Yeah. Um, so with that being my first experience with I guess being discriminated for my my race and my identity, um, I, I continued to experience things like that up until twenty twenty. So as far as how twenty twenty went for me, um took me a minute to get there, but <laughs> No, it's it's good. <laughs> as far as twenty how twenty twenty went for me, um course we were all in lockdown so I was struggling with wanting to go out and protest however there were many aspects that played into that um number one the pandemic I have people in my family that are high risk Mm -hmm. so I couldn't 100% go out and show my support for 
my my community on yeah. the streets around big crowds of people. Um, also, just safety aspects of it. Um, peaceful protests would turn into dangerous ones because um, police would unfortunately come in and more times than not throw the first throw the first the punch. punch. Yeah, yeah, I think metaphorical right punch <laughs> or literal <laughs> punch yeah. or literal. Oftentimes literal. So I didn't think it'd be a very safe situation for me physically to go into. So I'd have to find other ways to, um, I guess, express my support. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I turned to social media, although not necessarily always the most influential. Mm -hmm. I think that it was the best way for me to express myself in that time, Mm -hmm. especially when I was going through so much, I guess, internal... I don't even know how to word this properly because there was so much going on just seeing members of my community just being killed Mm -hmm. and the people that killed them not facing any sort of punishment. Yeah. Like, it it was difficult for me to see, like, unarmed black men and women and children, Mm -hmm. literal children, my age, being shot and killed. Yeah. Or suffocated, whatever the the method was, but it was, it was, it was difficult for me to see that. And it was difficult for me to sit there and feel like I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. And and same thing with um, with an upward tick in, in hatred towards immigrants, mm-hmm. especially Mexican immigrants and, and Spanish-speaking immigrants in general. It was difficult for me to see families be torn apart, sent to detention centers in different parts of the country, little children being torn away from their mothers. It was difficult for me to see that because I come from a family of Mexican immigrants. Yeah. And it was difficult for me to sit there and once again not be able to do anything because when I was too young, two was too dangerous, three, corona. So, yeah. Um, no, absolutely. But, I mean, of course, like you said before, um, 2020 definitely sparked a huge movement for the Asian community. So, yeah. get into that, I guess. <laughs> get into it, yeah. Um, yeah. I think, similar to you, like, I don't think I noticed a lot of, I don't want to say hate, I'll say microaggressions, we'll go microaggressions. Mm -hmm. I don't think I noticed a lot of microaggressions. I think the the ones that really stand out in my memory are some joke that some fourth grader made when Mm -hmm. I was back in fourth grade about, like, Chinese people named after pots and pans being, like, pushed down the stairs. That's horrible. Yeah, so I think that was my first, like, memorable encounter with racism, but it hasn't really, it never really, um... I guess cross my mind mm-hmm. as a microaggression because I grew up in a very predominantly white community. Okay. I grew up in a your average like white picket fence mm-hmm. neighborhood, you know, family of four, very sheltered, I will say. I have a very sheltered life. Um and so I really didn't notice anything until well, I mean, and then the other microaggression I guess is, you know, being asked what Asian are you? What you know, asking my mother, like, where do you really come from? You know, all those really fun... Horrible, horrible, yeah. You know, really fun microaggressions. Of course. But I think it got worse in 2020 mm-hmm. um, because the Trump administration, first, first, the first, you know, ob- obviously bad part was that this, the coronavirus did originate in Wuhan, China. Yes. Which then became ammunition for the Trump administration to call it the Chinese virus, the Kung flu, et cetera, et cetera. Another excuse, like we said before... To be, right. To, to basically justify yeah, discrimination, justify, yeah. dis- justify racism. Exactly. Um, and so that led to a rise in Asian hate crimes. Mm-hmm. And essentially, it was scary to go... It was obviously scary to go out to the supermarket because of coronavirus. Mm-hmm. Um, but the added pressure of just my predominantly white community not attacking us, but, you know, pointing fingers almost. Uh, pointing fingers. Right. Um, and... It, it was just a sudden 180 because I feel like Asian Americans, while we haven't faced, I don't want to say, but we haven't faced the full weight of the systemic racism in the U.S., mm-hmm. there's definitely, I f- definitely feel like a different level because of this myth called the model minority. Um, right. So just to like explain this a little bit for those who do not know, mm-hmm. the model minority is a term that was first coined by William Peterson in 1966. It was in some New York Times article that was titled um, The Success Story, Japanese American Style. And essentially, he was pointing out the fact that even though the Japanese were interned, so bring it back to history, history, Japanese internment, even though Japanese people were interned, 20 years later, they were able to succeed in America. 
Mm. And he put this on cultural values, um, practices, et cetera, et cetera. And so this myth of the model minority has been harmful to the Asian American community because there's this expectation to succeed. Right. Um, there's this expectation to, you know, it like almost creates a hierarchy in racial oppression in the United States. Obviously, this is how it was first used. It was used as a weapon against racial groups in a way to be like, hey, you know, African-Americans, you should be more like Asian-Americans mm-hmm. because they were able to succeed after internment. Why can't you succeed after this? Mm-hmm. And it fully fails to recognize, like you said, all the historical oppress- uh, oppressive systems mm-hmm. that were already put in place before Asian-Americans even got here, mm-hmm. right? Like Jim Crow, like, you know, civil rights movement, like, all Mm -hmm. those are completely ignored when we say Asian Americans are the model minority. Yeah. And so, just first having this stereotype of, you know, being the model, being, you know, the grade A student, being smart, being able to Mm -hmm. succeed, to then completely be flipped around in 2020 and be like, you are the reason why Americans are dying, you are the reason for this virus. It was like, it was kind of shocking, Mm -hmm. almost. It was like, First, you expected us to be the great success stories of America. And now all of a sudden, we are the reason why Americans can no longer go outside. And just so seeing that like 180 flip Mm -hmm. from, I guess, tolerance to violence was almost shocking. Yeah. Because I don't really think we see Asian Americans in the news as much as we see black people Mm -hmm. and Latin American people or Mm -hmm. Hispanic people, right? And so, like, not finally seeing, but like seeing people of my community being, you know, beaten, mm-hmm. like, p- police brutality, we mm-hmm. saw with Black Lives Matter, um, just seeing that was, like, eye-opening, mm-hmm. and a little bit shocking, and a little bit, like, I've never had to face this before, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And so, kind of finding myself and my community was huge during this time, yeah. um, and I think, I have to accredit a lot of it to my English teacher, my mm-hmm. senior English teacher, because she pointed out that Everything that I was feeling during the time of, you know, just being confused, feeling targeted, it was all valid. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the first time I had to step back and be like, okay, I come from two different families, Mm -hmm. and this is what makes me me. This is what I identify as. Now, how do I go from here? How do I continue to support my community? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, keeping myself safe, because we were in the pandemic. We still are. Mm -hmm. Um, But also feeling like I'm not just abandoning everything. And I think that was, I think 2020 was a really eye-opening year for me because I was able to fully accept my white part of my family and as well as my Chinese part. Mm -hmm. And I think 2020 was the year I fully became proud to be a Chinese American Mm -hmm. because then I could go share my story with others and hopefully make them feel empowered. Kind of like what we're doing with this podcast, you know? Like just trying to connect to others. Exactly. I I feel like as though, I feel as though we're, both and from the stories that we've told we're in a constant state of of growth and learning mm-hmm. just um both of us having to to face discrimination and then the uptick in it um after 2016 2020 mm-hmm. um i think that we're just both constantly learning how to deal with our i wouldn't necessarily necessarily say double identity but two two important aspects of huge important aspects of our identity yeah um and i think we're both just in this this constant state of, of growth, and I think that's it's like almost is, healing as well, yeah, right? Like, yeah. kind of each new hurdle that we overcome, or mm-hmm. each new experience that we have, yeah. whether it's hurtful or beautiful, mm-hmm. it's like we're healing parts of ourself, and then hopefully we can extend that knowledge to others so mm-hmm. that we can heal our community as a whole. Yeah, and I feel like this class has played such a huge part in it. I think that like the the sources that we've been given in this class, like Thirteenth Documentary, the Sixteen Nineteen Project, um learning about the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, mm-hmm. I think all of these different um, different articles that we've been fortunate enough to read and, and documentaries that we've been fortunate enough to watch have really contributed to our overall growth as people. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, I just, I think something really important for me to add is, um, well, I guess I'd like to mention this one book that I recently just read, and yeah, I, I tend to be author, uh, the author's event for it. Um, it's called The Sum of Us, and the author is Heather McKee. Ooh, love. And it basically talks about how um, racism in America and, like, the systemic oppression that all minorities face, mm-hmm. how it 
ultimately affects the some of us. It affects all of us. Right. And although these issues may seem very, I guess, isolated to these communities of color, mm-hmm. they ultimately impact everyone. For example, if you put a sewage plant or different, um, I guess, uh, freeways through through communities of color, mm-hmm. of course you're directly impacting them because you're you're tearing up their houses and and the 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 hub of poor air pollution is, is right in their communities. Yeah. However, the environment the, the air doesn't just stay there. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah no. The environment we all live under the same the same sky. We all live under the same sky and that's that's the name of um a chapter in the book, the the same sky, I believe. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really how um this all this history and our, our present experiences and everything, like all of this oppression, discrimination, it ultimately affects everyone. Yeah. Like, we, we all, although it affects us differently and um, maybe at different quantities, like, we all it, experience it differently, it 100, 100% affects everyone. And so to think that it doesn't affect me, I'm going to leave it alone, that's that's definitely not the approach to take. I think, once again, we all need to take a part in being a historian, his, yes. <laughs> historian yeah, yeah, yeah. excuse yes. me. And definitely take that head on, and I think that's something really important that our class has taught us. Just take a, learn learn about your history and learn how you can use your, use your history and in your knowledge, your experiences to there then like go forth and heal other communities. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think something that was I want to say almost healing mm-hmm. as a part of this class was being able to see how this line of or systemic discrimination has not only impacted my community mm-hmm. but has impacted like from the very beginning we talked about like in the indigenous peoples yes. how discrimination has and settler colonialism has mm-hmm. impacted black yeah. people how it's impacted hispanic people how it's impacted immigrants asian americans etc cetera, etc cetera. Yes. and i think something really powerful about having an ethnic studies class mm-hmm. is being able to not only learn about your own history but really focus in mm-hmm. on the histories of others right it it's like almost like we find brotherhood or camaraderie in the experiences of each other and I think we're able to have conversations like these because Mm -hmm. we realize that a lot of our experiences one stem from the same place stem from Mm -hmm. the same histories but two our experiences now are very much interconnected Mm -hmm. and how we can almost bond over I guess our issues Mm -hmm. with the system right and maybe even come up with solutions on how to change the system like I think something that I've highly advocated for is not changing the system because obviously the system we have right now does not work it is broken yeah whether we're talking about government economics social systems yeah they're all broken and i think it's really time to advocate for a new system to be made and i think with the growth and i guess emphasis on diversity in Mm -hmm. companies politics leadership positions i think we are going into an age where a new system can be created it's just we almost have to persuade those who are in power mm-hmm. that the system that's in place right now, even though it benefits them by creating a new system, in no way is their mm-hmm. benefits going to shrink. Yeah. there's. A, I feel like I know this was said in your book, um, mm-hmm. The Some of Us, but I think this idea has pointed out that white people feel like when we add equality mm-hmm. or when something becomes more equitable, yeah. they're somehow losing a piece of the pie. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's right? a zero-sum theory. That's what the book's named after. It, yeah, like you said, it basically explains that both parties can't win. If one's winning, that must mean the other one's losing, but yeah. that's not the truth. No. We can both win, and by, like you said, the way to do that is by building a new system to ensure that everyone is winning. Yeah. 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 It's just, I just think that in order to let this new system be born and grow, mm-hmm. we have to dismantle this idea that those in power will lose something, like you said. Like, every equity and equality are not about, like, white people losing something, Mm -hmm. white people losing power. Mm -hmm. It's more so about letting others succeed Mm -hmm. and reach that same level of success. Mm -hmm. I think this is hard to do because of the deep systemic racism in our country. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, this country was founded on the taking of indigenous land. Yeah. And that's something we still have a hard time acknowledging, especially here at USD. You know, I think that the land acknowledgement was something that's only become a recent development in our efforts to recognize the people's lands we have stolen. 
Um, and I don't think that's enough. Mm -hmm. I think it is important to acknowledge. However, I don't think it dismantles the system. Yeah. And I think, again, it just comes back to that idea of creating a new system. And I think that's a very heavy question. But I think that's one that I feel like our generation is ready to tackle with the amount of movements we've had literally in the past two years. Mm -hmm. Like BLM and Stop Asian Hate. And even with, you know, other like LGBTQ plus movements. Mm -hmm. I think there's... A very wide range of acceptance in this nation mm -hmm. and I think that's what's going to lead to a lot of healing in at least the younger generations identity and communities yeah 100% agree <laughs> um I well think that's it right yeah. I think we kind of covered everything um that we wanted to cover at least for today yeah Obviously, there's, there's so much more that goes into... <laughs> oh, yeah, no. I, I don't think we saw, saw solved systemic racism today at all. <laughs> of course not, but I, I think we definitely talked about the the, the important aspects of our, our history that have led us to this point, um, that have led us to our experiences, and, and what we've learned in our class, the 1619 Project, 13th Documentary, mm -hmm. um, the Chinese um, Exclusion, Exclusion Act, Act yep. and, and our outside resources like the sum of us and and how you brought in where the model minority um stereotype or it uh label comes from i think yeah. that um like all of this put together is really um, i think it's a well-rounded i feel like just as like a note on this final project i think this mm -hmm. was a really great way for us to converse about the well-roundedness of this class and Absolutely. how deep this class goes and i think honestly that it's very hard to learn about ethnicity in the 17 weeks that we are here. Exactly. Um, I, I think ethnicity and ethnic studies is an ongoing, ongoing course, conversation, ongoing yeah. conversation, and it obviously can't be wrapped up in an hour or wrapped up in a 17 week long course. Mm -hmm. But I think this or a 30 minute podcast. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or in a 30 minute podcast. But I think this final project has allowed us to talk out a lot of connections that we've made in the class and connect them to our own experiences. And I think exactly. that's how we learn the best mm -hmm. is by looking at what we've lived through and applying the history that we've learned mm -hmm. in ethnic studies and just, you know, kind of mm -hmm. conversing about it with people who have either similar backgrounds or even just different backgrounds. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that this completely, this, this project or this experience has completely solidified the fact that um, what we've learned in this course is definitely for us as people and, and help us helped us um, not necessarily come to terms with our identity, but just recognize other aspects of ourselves that we may have not recognized before. So becoming that I definitely we read about the historian yes. <laughs> yeah. at the beginning yeah. of the class and now I feel like we're becoming it's full circle, you it know. It really is. Yeah, no, so I definitely I, I think profe for that. I think um, this course and just the content of it and our sources are or the, the sources that we pulled from, I think that they really taught us. Yeah, this definitely wasn't our first conversation about no. race and stuff. So, but it was fun to be able to record it yeah. and, you know, get to actually, like, apply some mm -hmm. real learning that we've done yeah. to our conversations that we already have. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Thank That's you for it. listening to our Half and Half episode today. And we hope you'll join us back next week. Maybe we'll do another one. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.